organization. Again, my name is Stephanie Picardi. Um, I'm a senior business consultant with Top Step. And I've got just a, a slide presentation here. It's quite detailed. I think it would be helpful um, after the session to refer to. So as far as slides go, it breaks a few of the rules in terms of a lot of bullet points and things. Um, but there is a lot of good information there. And like I said, after the session, I think it would be a useful um, reference for you. So if you'd like those, we can um, go ahead and send them out or you can request them. Um, I'll go through the presentation and I'll also be hopping into the product um, to demo some things live for you. I did want to couple, cover a couple of upcoming events that we have. Um, so Top Step is hosting um, open air workshops in a city near you. Um, we just hosted one last week that was in Boston. I was there with Jody Cisai on that one. Um, so that was a good session. And then she did one in Atlanta earlier this week. Um, we have DC and Chicago coming up next. So we've got a couple of dates slated June 25th and 26th for DC. Um, I believe there is still space available for those if you'd like to sign up. And Chicago in July, July 23rd and 24th. Um, we also have the open air user groups. Um, so we have those scheduled a couple every month. Um, so upcoming ones, we have Houston and Toronto coming up in June. Um, again, those are you can register for those. Um, there's still space available. If you go to the Top Step Consulting website, and I do have um, our website on the last slide. I should probably insert it here for you. but. If you go to our website, click on News and Events, then you can um, find the links to register for the reporting workshops and the user group, and also view the schedule as far out as it's booked. Um, our next webinar will be July 18th, and that is Integration Options with Salesforce.com. <clears throat> okay, so today we're going to go through um, approaches and best practices for resource management. And this covers you know, just some general best practices and general approaches for doing resource management um, and also how you can use features and functionality within open air to support those um, approaches. The thing with resource management um, is really it's dependent on how your, man how your organization is managing your resources and how your organization is um, is structured. So if you've got a very siloed organization where you have teams and departments, um, you know, they only work on projects within those teams and departments. Or maybe it's regionally based. You know, you have a, an office in France and an office in Hong Kong and they don't really mix resources. They're not charging to each other's projects. Um, so as far as that goes, there's a lot of questions that um, there really isn't a, necessarily a wrong way of doing it or one solution is better than the other. It really depends on how your organization is structured. So we'll talk about some of those questions that you'd want to you know, kind of ask to drive to a best practice over the other. <clears throat> and then measuring utilization. So this is specific to um, open air. I mean, we'll talk about just some general concepts of utilization. Um, and calculations, but I'm also going to show you how you can get those calculations into your reports out of open air. And capacity and staffing needs. So you've got your resource management in open air, and now how do you do your reporting on that? Um, how do you do your bookings and look at your charts and booking types and all of those details that go into that? And then we have profiles and skill searches. Um, so Uninet does support, or excuse me, OpenAir does support putting in a um, skills database into the system, and then you can search for resources um, that have those skills associated with them. Would also help you to identify any gaps where you have in competencies. Maybe you're trying to grow a particular practice or start a new business line. Um, so looking at your resources and the skills that they have to determine if you need to hire out or hire subcontractors, et cetera. So starting with the resource management um, approaches, like I said, this really it reflects how your organization is structured and how your resources work on projects. You know, there's no point in trying to drive one particular model over the other if that's just not how your organization is, you know, how it operates. So there's two main models that we talk about. It's a, there's centralized and decentralized. 
And I didn't realize that we had the, that in there. Um, so centralized is where you have um, essentially have a resource management function within your organization. So typically you have either a resource manager that owns a pool of resources and they're responsible for you know, managing those resources utilization, making sure that they get staffed on projects, et cetera. It could even go into making sure that they're um, you know, put on projects that will help them advance their career or for cross-functional training, things like that. Um, this could be a group of resource managers that manage a resource pool or a single resource manager that's managing a resource pool. But essentially, all of the staffing flows through um, this centralized person or group. So this typically involves a request and fulfillment process where um, project owners or project managers have resource needs for their project. They request them to the resource manager. This could be just generic or by skill, or this could be named resources. I want to have John on my project for the next three months full time. And then a resource manager is responsible for you know, approving that if it's a named resource request or fulfilling it if it's a more generic request. I need a developer on my project full time for three months. And then the resource manager fulfills that with a named resource. Um, so this does allow for some more detailed tracking of information. Um, typically you have you know, some custom fields where you're capturing this, this detail. You'll also want to look at some analysis on the fulfillment of those requests. Um, if you requested two FTE and got one and a half, um, when you submitted your request versus when you were able to get it fulfilled, et cetera. Um, the next is a decentralized, and so this is really where um, managers or project managers, project owners, um, whatever terminology you're using for your, for your projects, um, they're allowed to schedule resources. So this really puts the onus on the project managers to be searching for resources. Um, you know, they may have people that in mind that they know have a certain skill set or know, have experience with these types of projects. So they want to pull from those named resources. But what you need to instill there in your process is that there's some rules around assigning resources or booking resources. So where you're saying, okay, you're, we're going to allow you to go ahead and book these resources, but if you're overbooking them, then we do have you know, someone who owns the overall um, monitoring of conflicts. So looks across all of the resources and sees, okay, who's overbooked, who's underbooked. Um, if we allow project managers to just book their favorite resources all the time, sometimes you end up with those um, resources that are overbooked and continuously overbooked, and then resources that are you know, on the bench or, or underbooked. So you still need someone to kind of monitor that and where there are conflicts where someone has book someone who's going to be on vacation or something, or a resource is double booked. You know, someone highlights those, whether this is a weekly meeting um, with all of the, the PMs just to review any of the conflicts. But it does allow for project managers, rather than having this request fulfillment that, you know, I'm requesting a named resource, and I know you're going to give me that named resource. 90% of the time they're available. I've already talked to them, or I already know. Um, that they're going to be slated on for my project. Um, so sometimes that request fulfillment can be a little bit onerous when you have a de decentralized um, resource management approach. Uh, again, the thing to take away from that is still requiring someone to kind of monitor um, and manage those conflicts. So typically we keep this you know, pretty straightforward. Um, don't want to do too much detailed tracking because you do have you know, PMs, managers, project owners that have their day-to-day -day job and need to be managing projects and not just maintaining resource data. Um, that does require, though, that you have either users are managing skill profiles or some administrator is making sure that those skill pro profiles are up to date because you don't have that centralized resource management view that's, that's maintaining that data in the system. So two you know, very different resource management approaches. Again, one is not better than the other. It's which one fits your organization um, and how your resources are structured, how your projects work, um, and how your staffing works. 
<clears throat> so that brings me to some of the questions that you'll want to consider. Um, now some of you may have, you may be doing resource management today in spreadsheets. I find most customers are, are doing some form of resource management, even if it's kind of ad hoc. It's, okay, we know we have a bunch of projects in the pipeline. We want to see what our resource availability is. Um, you know, who do we have and do we need to hire, et cetera. So maybe you have an admin goes out and finds what everybody's working on, when they're expecting to complete, et cetera. I mean, that's the, you know, kind of bare bones and very um, reactionary approach to it. But I do find that there's some spreadsheet out there where people are tracking or at least occasionally capturing um, who's booked and on what they're, they're booked on. So you may be starting from that. You may be starting from something where you have, you know, a resource management approach. There is, sometimes there's a request form. It's just all done in emails, et cetera. So what you want to look, like, what you want to look at, regardless of where you are in that maturity model, um, what are your current resource management challenges? So I find from conferences and conventions and, you know, guest speakers that I hear from and all of that, that resource management is the number one challenge across all industries. So when I say resource management is a challenge, what does that really mean? That you could have challenges with overbooked and underbooked resources, just really not being able to know on demand um, what your resources are working on and how your projects are staffed. It could be that you are tracking this information, but you're still running into project delays because of the staffing. So maybe you've got people that are not working to plan. You're booking them on these projects and then someone else is coming in and, you know, your data looks all pretty, but someone else is coming on the back end and saying, oh, hey, can you just do this for me? You know, this is high priority or they're kind of circumventing the process. So really what's your challenge? Do you need to lock down on your process? Um, do you need to just do basic blocking and tackling and capture information? So I would start there um, and then look at how your organization is structured. So I've mentioned this a couple of times already. Um, do you have a matrix organization? Are people from all departments and teams, um, can they be pulled to work on, on a project? Um, or is it really more siloed where you have you know, a team or a, a product line? Um, you know, maybe it's by skill set. You have people that are working, that are grouped together to work on projects owned by their team or their department. Um, again, geographic or regionally based. So um, often, often with global companies I see that you kind of have a regionally based approach but also can have a matrixed approach because sometimes you do need to pull those resources because you just don't have a resource available or with the skill set so you have to pull from another region. Um, but ideally for cost purposes and margins, you'd like to keep it within the same region so you're not incurring a lot of travel costs, relocation, et cetera. Um, other things to be looking at is who's responsible for resource staffing. So who owns those resources? Typically you do have um, you know, line managers. Are those line managers also responsible for um, staffing staffing those resources. So they may be responsible for their utilization and managing all of that, but are they, do PMs need to go to the line manager to get approval to get um, that resource on their project? Um, are PMs just gen, um, requesting generic resources? So they're not allowed to request named resources. Um, how are your projects getting staffed today? So all of those things I would be looking at, um, and that's going to drive you to your answer of, do we go centralized or decentralized? And there's variations in there, right? So in open air, when we talk about resource management, um, we're typically talking about the resources module. I will say that you could do, resor you could do some resource management um, using project task assignments. That requires a lot of diligence on managing task dates, um, which can be, you know, a, a bit cumbersome and can require a lot of, um, a lot of time spent just maintaining those task dates. So resource management, there's a resource module in OpenAir. Um, now this may be if you go into OpenAir and look at your drop down for your modules and you don't see resources there, 
it's likely because it's hidden. Um, so you may have been hiding the resources module because you weren't using it. It may depend on the role that you have. Maybe you don't have access to that um, because your organization is not implementing it. So the resources module is a resource-centric view um, as opposed to the projects module which looks at an individual project and resources staffed there. So it's not a full picture of how that resource is staffed, it's taking the project-centric view. So they are two separate modules. Um, there is an option to have a project um, booking grid, so I'm going to talk about bookings in just a second, but you can have that within a project. So project managers have that project-focused view. Um, there's a few drawbacks to that. Uh, I will say more often than not, I recommend using the resources module, even though it requires you to go out of the projects module to the resources module. Um, it's really a, a cleaner picture and um, less likely to kind of be, be confusing the information. So again, there is an option to have it within the projects module. Um, we can certainly talk about that, but there are some drawbacks to that approach um, and you do need to be pretty diligent in entering your bookings the same way. So if you're doing it in the projects module or the resources module, you want to pick one way of entering those. Um, otherwise, you can end up with some duplications um, in the bookings. So coming to bookings, um, which by the way, bookings may also be referred to as allocations. Um, occasionally, I see them called plans. Uh, however, there is the concept of plan hours on task assignments. So I try to stay away from using the word plan there. But allocations is another one, or staffings. Um, bookings is kind of an interesting name here because I know for various parts in an organization, booking can mean something different. So you may want to consider for your organization, um, if bookings is already a commonly used term to refer to maybe a sales order, um, or timesheet entry. I, I hear that a lot too when I'm booking time to a project. They're referring to timesheet entries. So this is one area that you may want, you know, the terminology override um, may be useful to you. So bookings are the resource scheduling mechanism and um, this is really the most widely used resource scheduling mechanism. Booking requests support a resource request and fulfillment workflow. Um, the booking request would be the starting point for a, or typically would be a starting point for a centralized resource management approach. So you have PMs enter booking requests. Those booking requests get approved by the resource managers and resource managers manage the resulting booking. Um, roles and filter sets can be configured to support your visibility here. So you may have, um, and, and Actually, I should couple this with the last bullet there on the various controls and the resources settings. Um, one of the commonly um, one of the commonly followed processes is that you'll allow PMs to request named resources and maybe even enter bookings for a named resource. Um, you can use booking types or booking requests um, to support an approval process. And then once it's approved, those booked resources are available to be assigned to a um, task assignment. So then the PM can go in and enter the task assignment, which is what grants you access to charge in the timesheet. So that setting allows re project managers to, you know, they're able to see all resources so they can search for resources. They can even enter in those booking requests or even bookings but you have the control of who, who can actually be assigned on that project. So until that approval of the booking is done, um, that resource can't be assigned to the project. So that's where you're allowing for visibility into more resources, but also having the control over who can actually be assigned. So you can have the, the resource management um, and resource-centric view taken into consideration. Um, so there's other controls on, under the resources settings um, that you should certainly look through. Some of those being, um, are, are you doing schedule requests in open air and do you want those to generate bookings um, for those schedule exceptions? So I approve a schedule request, do I want to have a booking for that schedule exception? A um, couple of other configuration items like the booking types, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. but 
booking types we commonly use to classify the booking and so that you can have some color coding in your chart to understand um, the priority of those bookings. For example, I may have a booking type for training, a booking type for proposed work or soft versus hard. Um, and so if I need to pull a resource and I see, well, they're 100% booked, but they're booked on something that is still in the pipeline, and I've got a confirmed project I want to put them on, that may be a driver to say, I'm going to pull them off of that soft booking, off of that other project, and put them on the confirmed work that we have. Or if I know that they're going to be out of the office for training versus out of the office on vacation, is there anything that we can do to work around that? Do I know that they'll have some additional availability, or maybe I can have them move that training class um, to another date to support my, my project requirements. So we use the booking types there. Um, so there's really a few just settings, um, the booking types, and then if you want to get into the profiles and skills. But ultimately, resource management, you already have your people, you already have your projects. It's more around the process and how you set up on who does what and when. Um, there isn't a lot of configuration required um, to set up. There isn't the, you know, we need to load a bunch of data like we do with the projects and the, um, the users. That information is already there. Okay, so going back to kind of marry up the two here. So we talked about best practices being centralized and um, decentralized. And then we talked about resource management and open air, bookings, booking requests, um, some of the settings. So here I want to go through to combine the two and talk about, okay, with a centralized um, approach and open air, what are we talking about, open air specifics here? Um, talked about a little, little bit of this already. I know it's a lot of bullet points here, so I think it will be helpful for you to refer to after the session. Um, for the centralized best practice, typically we start with a booking request, or you can use a booking type of request to support a quote-unquote requesting process using just the bookings and bypassing the booking request. Um, advantages of the booking request is you do have built-in automated workflow for review and approval. Um, so that really does support the back and forth of, you know, hey, I request this resource. I want them, you know, maybe you want the resource for 100 hours in the month of June. Uh, that resource is only available for 80 hours. The kind of back and forth of um, the resource manager fulfilling what they can or providing an alternate resource. Um, if they completely reject it and say, nope, this person isn't available at all, or the, what the person that they do staff, the requester doesn't you know, think, says, oh, well, they don't have their PMP certification, so that's a requirement for this contract. We'll need to assign a different resource. So it supports the, the back and flow workflow, the um, rejection of booking requests, the updating of the requests. And then once that request is fulfilled and approved, then you have a book, the result is a booking in the system. A um, couple of, well, a drawback here is that the resource, excuse me, the booking requests do not appear in the resource charts as booked. So the resource chart, the bookings chart just looks at bookings. It does not consider booking requests. So when you're looking at someone, you only see those approved bookings. You're not seeing anything that's pending in the request. Um, another thing that I've run into is with um, generics. So where you have you know, regionally based um, resources or you have maybe by product line or something. So if I have a consultant that works, with, for, works on a con particular product, um, I may need to have multiple generics to support that. Um, so I can request by generics. The other thing is when you have a um, booking request, that approval process is set on the user. So you have either you've got a team of people that are managing this pool of resources or you have one person. Um, works well when it's just the manager approves the booking request, um, but you do need to consider are you going to have to have kind of dummy users to support your booking request workflow. Then we have the bookings with a request booking type. Um, 
So this is bypassing the booking request. You would just hide that completely. That's something you can turn off or on in the system. Um, does allow for, well, there, there's a couple things. There is a, there was an enhancement in March, I believe, um, that allows for an approval process for bookings. It's not widely used or recommended. There are some limitations to that. So when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what we need. Um, unfortunately, the way it's configured in there, you, you run into some of the same limitations as you do with booking requests. Um, in any case, it, it's certainly available if you come across that um, and have questions about that, happy to talk, talk you through it. Um, what we typically do is use a booking type that's called request and allow only those project managers or project owners that are requesting resources, they only have access to that booking type. Um, typically we end up with multiple booking types, so you have a request soft booking, request hard booking, request training, um, approved, soft booking approved, hard booking approved, training. So you give the request ones to the PM and then you have the resource managers um, have, the, have the approved ones. And in order to restrict who's available for assignment, you can set that by booking type. So you can say only resources with bookings that have a booking type of the approved ones are available for assignment. Um, this does allow you to view the, the full resource request and approved bookings in the booking chart. Um, you can configure notifications um, so that people can be notified when a, a booking is quote unquote submitted. Um, however, that workflow is not built in. So you're really using, using the list and the notifications to support a workflow, but it's not a built in approval process, if you will. So on, on all of this, timely response is going to be your key for adoption. And I would also add that adherence to the data in OpenAir, and this actually goes for both approaches. If you're not using the date, data in OpenAir to make decisions and you're allowing people to circumvent the process, it's going to, be, it's going to continue to be challenging for you. Um, so you, what you want to do is, one, in a centralized you know, booking request, process, you need to um, respond with fulfillments and do that not only in the order that they're submitted, um, in all fairness, um, but also being able to do that quickly. Otherwise, you end up with a lot of email back and forth. Hey, I submitted this request. It hasn't been approved. I, I need some on my project yesterday. You know, you end up with a lot of that email traffic. So the timely response is really going to be key here, and that will get the buy-in from those people that are doing the requesting. It will seem more cumbersome if they have to send outside emails to get the booking request fulfilled. So going on to the decentralized um, best practices. So what this does is it focuses on your project alignment. Um, your project managers, they know the resource, resource requirements. Um, they know them the best and they know kind of the full picture of it. So they may know that Oh, this particular client, they really like people on site all the time, and I happen to know that Susie loves to be in Toronto every week. So they may know those kinds of details being closer to the project, whereas a centralized view, you're looking at a resource manager who doesn't have that client relationship and complete understanding of the project. So this can be great, um, especially if you can have kind of just the oversight of managing conflicts. So a couple of things that we can use here is the booking, um, excuse me, the project booking grid or worksheet. Um, so I mentioned that this is available. This is something that you can um, choose to have from within the project. Allows you to copy bookings from one project to another, so that's nice. Um, unfortunately, there are some limitations with the booking type usage. Um, that's one of the primary reasons that we we don't recommend this one. Um, I'm not to say I don't have clients that I've recommended it for, but it's just not the most common. Um, then you have the resource grid or worksheet um, in the resources module. And this you can filter out. You can filter by project, filter by resources. Um, you also have custom fields. So if you've got, instead of doing a full skills database, you just have some particular attributes like willingness to travel, um, maybe the location, things like that. 
so you can leverage those fields on your bookings. Um, again, the only difference, not the only difference, but the primary difference is that it's outside of the projects module. You do have to go to the resources module for that. Um, but it's a bit more flexible and, and I think reliable and easier to enforce. This require bookings prior to task assignment. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times. So that's something that we, we typically see is implemented. So that ensures that we're not circumventing the bookings process or the resource request process by just assigning the resources we want anyway. And then bookings can become the schedule. So you can do bookings at a daily, weekly, monthly level. Um, you could also do them bound by you know, task dates. I don't see that done as frequently. Um, typically it's done on a more you know, daily, weekly schedule. Um, so that way it's consistent with any of your month-end reporting. Um, and from looking at a resource view, you don't necessarily want to see the resource view by the project schedule. You want to see the resource view by a week or a month for managing utilization, capacity, et cetera. <clears throat> So those are our approaches. I'm actually going to step out of the presentation now and just go into the product. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I like to see some of this stuff. So I'm going into the resources module here. And I'm, we'll go through pretty quickly on the booking request. So resources module, booking request. This is something you can choose um, to enable or to hide. And while we're in here, I'll flip back and forth a little bit between the administration module. So under the resources settings, you have other settings. And here's where you'll have the enable booking requests. And there's some other rules around booking requests. So maybe booking requests can only be created for generics. So this would not allow um, those entering the request, typically your, your project managers, would not be able to request named resources. Um, booking request approvals are only for the requested resource. I don't use this a whole lot because um, a lot of times you're requesting a resource and then your resource manager may not be able to provide that resource but may be able to provide an alternate for you. Whereas if you have this enabled, it just, they do the approval and then that's it. You can't, you would have, they would have to reject it. You'd have to resubmit the request with the named resource. So it would be a little bit more back and forth on that. Um, and also not allowing the booking type to be modified on the um, booking request. So there's a couple of options here that you'll want to consider when, you're enable the book, when you enable the booking request. Um, I just did the, the one enable it, which makes this menu item appear here, this tab. Um, so booking request, pretty simple form. I select my, my resource. I select a, a project. I can enter my date in here. Now with the booking request, I don't have the um, booking worksheet, which I'll show you in a minute. So if I'm requesting a resource, you may want to consider, I may be requesting them for you know, something like the 13th through, I don't know, the 23rd of, or the 19th of July. Those are kind of funny dates, don't really line up with anything. Um, maybe it aligns up with my task dates, maybe it doesn't. Um, so that's kind of one thing that you may want to drive them to say request resources in, in full weeks. Um, you can repeat booking requests, so I could repeat this for five weeks, but that way I have more of a um, Monday to Sunday view or Sunday to Saturday view um, that is actually meaningful. And with um, booking requests and bookings, you have percentage of time versus number of hours. Um, so you can do either or booking type, whether or not you want to allow this to be selected or you're even using that. Um, so you can see I have hard, internal, soft, time off. Um, so some of the booking types you just want to consider when you're looking at a chart, did you want, do you want to see anything broken out or color coded? Um, one of the ones I find is like training where they have to go off site for training. Um, time off is a good one to have in here. Internal time, is it an internal project? Um, hard and soft typically mean um, it's not yet confirmed work, so maybe they haven't signed the SOW yet or the project you know, hasn't been closed yet. Um, hard meaning, yep, this is absolute. So I can enter this in, click Save. 
So now I have a whoops, submitted. I didn't submit it. Um, save and submit here. So now it goes under notice my open, submitted, approved, rejected. So this should all look familiar from your timesheets, um, expense reports, invoices. Um, if I had an EMIQ, they'd be waiting my approval. I'm just looking at my Chris January request that I did here is under submitted. Once they're approved, I don't believe I have any under approved, but um, once it's approved, it moves into approved. If it's rejected, just like with a timesheet, it goes back into rejected and then it's on the requester to manage that. Um, once it is approved, then it turns into a booking. Now you can also bypass that booking request process and um, just use the bookings. So what I like about the bookings, a couple of things, I have my booking grid here, which is great. So it's easier to um, enter in the data, works more like an Excel spreadsheet in here, selecting resources. Just like with the timesheet, there's also a dynamic booking grid. Um, so maybe a little bit more user friendly for you. And then just entering in my, my hours here. Oops. Go ahead and save that. And I can move through periods by scrolling left or right. Um, I see total for each resource for each line, totals by month here. So I can use the settings um, to filter by resources, by projects, um, showing only my bookings, showing only the ones I created, things like that. Um, so there's quite a bit that you can do there. Then I have a chart view. Love the chart view. Let me. Oh, there are some bookings in here. Excellent. So I won't adjust the time range here for you. What I love about this chart is I can add the advanced filter to, so I can filter um, various things, filter by names, departments, just like with any other list. Here I'm just filtering for my employees. Um, I hover over the bars and I can see the um, time that's available and then the time that's booked that is broken down by, uh, by time type here. I can set my own color coding. Um, I have actions that I can take from here. So I can say create a booking, view the bookings for this guy. So here I view all of his bookings. Just takes me to a list view. Um, also within the resources module, search criteria, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, alerts, so if I wanted to set up any a daily utilization alert, we can set that up here. Um, if somebody is you know, falling below utilization or overbooked, um, so there are some alerts there. There's also notifications that you can do. If I'm in the resources module, um, I have notify booked resources when they're booked um, or when, even when it's been deleted notify managers when it's been booked, require booking types. So there's some settings on here that, that you may find valuable as well. Okay, so going back to the presentation. Current slide. Measuring utilization. So I could have a full webinar just on this. <laughs> I'm going to try to cover it here in about, I don't know, eight minutes or so. Um, Open Air does have some standard reports that have a series of um, equations in there for utilization. Those may work well for you. I would say most of my clients, I've worked with them on developing custom calculations, um, which allow you to create company-specific equations. And this also allows you a bit more flexibility in your reporting and analysis in the way that you break down the data. Um, utilization, and this is typically um, what I look like when I'm thinking about math. Utilization based on, is your denominator of hours of availability um, and your numerator being your hours, um, this is stated kind of funny, hours completed to drive types of utilization values. <laughs> um, what this means is the hours that you're using in the utilization calculation. So what qualifies? Um, I do, I have, you know, a lot of times clients are 
first thing that comes to mind with utilization is billable utilization. A lot of organizations have just a straight um, how many hours were billable over your available hours. Um, some organizations want to capture that that's one part of it, but if I wasn't billable, what else was I doing? Right? So was I working on internal activities that are considered productive? Was I really just on the bench? Was I on vacation or took time off? Was I out in training? Um, maybe I was doing some mentoring, helping bring up some, some new folks or training someone on um, you know, cross-functional training or something like that. So a lot of times you have the utilization number looking at your billable utilization, but then you also want to break down into that remaining time, what, did, what was it comprised of. So for denominator, there's um, the standard reports. There's a couple of um, options in the standard, or excuse me, in the user summary reports. But then there's also some on the advanced tab in reports. There's some um, built-in reports like historical utilization and such that use these standard calculations as well. So for the denominator, you can. I've got a little screenshot here. You can set what the denominator is if you're looking at booked or weighted booked. Weighted booked includes the um, probability percent of the project closing. So if you want to include those pipeline projects, but look at um, weighting that, those utilization numbers, you can do that. So there's two things, and this is also um, flows through the custom calculation, work schedule hours versus base work schedule hours. Um, work schedule hours is just your standard work week that you set up and the user is assigned to. So for a lot of U.S. companies, consider the standard 2080. Um, so work schedule hours is just 40 hours a week or 8 hours a day, um, Monday through Friday for 52 weeks. So that's where you get 2080. Base work schedule hours will vary based on um, schedule exceptions, so holidays and if you're using the time off um, schedule request and want to exclude vacation time from your um, utilization calculation. What I typically find is your utilization number, your target number, there's anywhere from 60 to you know 100 percent. I have organizations that have various targets. Typically, if it's a 60-hour target, um, then they're including the, the vacation time. If it's an 80-hour target, then they're excluding the vacation time. So the higher the target, I tip, I'm not saying this is 100% standard, but I typically find it depends on whether or not we're um, already accounting for that, the vacation time or if we're you know, not penalizing you for it during that period if you took vacation. Um, which is interesting because it drives some behavior when you know you have um, a project coming to a close, you don't have another one starting for a week, do you take the time off so you don't get dinged in your utilization? You know, I, it's interesting how these numbers can um, drive behavior. So for forecasting values, it's just looking at these straight hours. Historical values, um, you can look at specific types of timesheet hours, so whether or not you want to include the vacation time, the time off, things like that. Okay, um, so for non-standard values for the, um, this would be covering your custom calculation. There's a target utilization feature, so you can put in um, a target and measure against that target instead of measuring against total hours. So I can look at my target utilization is 80%. How did, did I hit 100% of my target or did I hit 50% of my target? So rather than just looking at the work schedule hours, it looks at what my target is supposed to be and how did I measure up against that. Um, this is very helpful um, for looking at different types of resources that may have different targets. So you have people that have um, you know, maybe some management responsibilities, so their target is 60%, whereas your full-time consultants may be 85, 90%. Um, when people are training, maybe the first three months, their utilization is 20% or something like that. Um, you can use the start dates in the, in the target utilization um, to compare against whether or not they met the target based on the date. 
Um, we also doing a fixed denominator. So if you wanted to say that our constant, um, what's available for each month is, a, is just a constant number of hours. So instead of having it have to do with the number of work days in that month, it's just 160 or something like that. Um, you can use a custom calculation called a custom detail field and set that as a constant. So this one being availability base month, 134 is a constant. So for numerators, um, again, some standard values there. There's for forecasting, um, booked hours, booked with actuals. So these are going to consider looking at actuals to a certain date and then um, what you have booked or signed going forward. Sorry, I'm going through, I'm running out of time here. <laughs> um, the numerator, handling your non-standard values, again, your custom calculations. So this is where we find a lot of value in using the custom calculations because you can do, um, you know, different calculate or you can have calculations for billable, productive, travel, training, etc. Um, you will need to enable an internal switch to use filters on the custom calculations, and your filter will vary depending on how you're classifying this time. Um, very commonly we see task type or time type. So you may have a task type of billable, non-billable, internal utilized, internal non-utilized, et cetera. Um, so depending on how you're categorizing that time, what entity you're using to categorize that, that's what filter you'll use. Um, the other thing is you want to consider keeping that consistent. So you don't want to have some time broken out by project where I say, here's my internal utilized project and all the tasks, and here's my internal non-utilized project and all the tasks, but then when I'm looking at billable versus non-billable and client projects, it's as a task type. That can be really tricky. So if you can use something like a task type or a time type to classify, you'll have the most flexibility and you keep it consistent. It'll be easy to, easy to maintain and people understand what's going into the calculation. Big tip here um, might seem like common sense to most of you, but um, thought it was worth mentioning that verify your calculations. Um, make sure it's doing what you think you're doing, especially when you come to things like base target hours or work schedule hours. Um, just do add those columns in the report to understand if your calculation is, is correct. Did I filter on the right thing? So I have my billable um, percent here and my billable hours calculation, my base target um, hours. My billable percent is based on my billable hours over my base target hours here. And if you do the math, it comes out like that. So validate your numbers before you go publishing this to everyone and then you've got someone coming out and saying, maybe you accidentally used base work schedule and billable hours and work schedule and billable percent. That could be an issue. As far as measuring utilization, um, you can have a multitude of reports to slice and dice the data. Um, that's the beauty of the custom calculations and, and the reporting in open air. Um, you may want to include hours and percentage. So we think of utilization in terms of percent. You may also want to break down the hours as well. Um, consider the audience. So if you've got individuals, they're just reporting on their own utilization. Um, they may want to see, see it broken down by how their performance periods are. Is it monthly, weekly, quarterly, et cetera, annually? Um, managers want to see their team. Executives may not be interested in the breakdown of the team. They may want to look at it by job code um, and look at across departments rather than looking at individual users. And resource managers being another, another audience you may have. So with the summary um, reports and your calculations, you can configure and display these in graphical views. So I have a, a line chart here by person for um, looks like the past, I don't know, 12 months or so. And then an employee breakdown. So this is not by person, it's just broken down by um, the different types of time and where those fall for last year. So capacity and staffing, a couple of things that we use here, hours, um, resources, and bill rates. So we want to understand with capacity and staffing not just what, what do we have available, what's our demand, but also using it um, to figure out revenue and do some forecasting on revenue as well. 
So you may want to look at the um, revenue capacity of a resource versus actual um, revenue generated. Um, you do also want to consider on your resources, um, who do you want to report on with this? Do you want to include subcontractors in your capacity planning? Maybe, maybe not. Um, job code filters, resources that you want, you want to exclude from this because they're not staffed on billable projects, so your internal or overhead resources. Um, so you may want to set up some, you know, some flag or some filter for whether or not they're considered in this. Um, so then with your capacity reports, you've got your bookings in there, um, so you can look at, you know, by user, target number of hours, expected revenue here, um, break it down by job code department, um, you know, look at your types of resources, whether they're employee, do you have subcontractors that are forecasted um, on your projects and how much revenue are they bringing in for you, things like that. And then with the last few minutes here, we've got our profile and skill searches. Um, so Open Air does allow for a profile database. I'm going to hop out of the product here, or out of the presentation into the product um, to show you where that's set up. It's not overly intuitive, but um, under your resources settings, and this is taking a little longer than it should. Okay. Under your resource settings, you have um, resource profiles. When you add a resource profile, so I have actually I overwrote job role, job role to be software knowledge. Um, when I go back to my resource settings, I now have a menu item called software knowledge. Within software knowledge, I have individual skills within those. Um, so when I'm associating these with resources, I would not associate them with software knowledge, I associate them with the individual skills here. And then you also have the um, attribute sets, which allow you to look at um, expertise being beginner, intermediate, expert, um, preference, yes or no. So if you have, or high, medium, low. So if you have um, something that you're capturing, like willingness to travel, well, beginner, intermediate, and expert doesn't really apply there, right? So with your resource profiles, you can say, um, I'll say, just I'll call this one willingness to travel. And then with my attribute set, I may want to say preference here, high, medium, or low, yes or no. Um, maybe you even have date or excuse me ranges. This is probably going to say willingness to travel. <laughs> it needs to say willingness to travel. I don't want to pluralize it. And whether or not you want to limit one selection. So a person can't have willingness to travel high and willingness to travel low, right? We want to just have it one setting there. And within my willingness to travel, maybe I say, you know, 80 about greater than 80%. So this is a kind of a non-standard um, use of the profile, but maybe it's say 50 to 80. Um, just want to kind of illustrate the flexibility here. So then in my bookings, or excuse me, in my resources, I can say, Jody here, here's her um, resource profile. I can add a new one. I can say, add a new willingness to travel. She would really like to travel more than 80%. She loves it. So you have a, a profile here for resources, and then when you're searching for resources, you can do some quick search just by a skill profile and say, I just want to pull up all of my people that have a profile, profile of willingness to travel and then I can filter that down if I want to. I can click into Jody, see her full skill set here, um, look at utilization, gives me a little chart. A minute. 
gives me a chart so I can look at where she's at now. I can look at engagement history. This is a nice feature to see what projects she's worked on. Did she have any time entries in there as well? Um, so kind of, kind of nice to look at that. Okay, and back to the presentation as I am running out of time. Um, the, so the thing with the skills is I find that people try to overthink it and capture everything. Really consider what's important for searching for resources. And it may not be their detailed skill set, it may be a higher level of skills. So just understanding what do you need to know basic, what, do, what are the things that you think about when you're requesting resources. You say, I need a resource with XYZ. Oh, and I also need them to be located here. You know. Those are the, that's where you want to keep your skill profiles at. If you have it too detailed, it just becomes too much to manage, and you can kind of get caught up in overthinking it before you can even get it implemented. So in summary, resource management in open air, highly dependent on your organizational structure. Um, you know, again, there isn't a right or a wrong way necessarily. It's just what's going to be the best fit for your structure. The utilization calculation is extremely configurable and flexible, um, and the capacity planning is realistic in open air. It's, you've already got your actuals in there, so doing the capacity planning in open air makes perfect sense. Um, it's no redundancy of data of having to capture people and projects somewhere else. And also consider your reporting um, when doing your staff planning for skill set needs. You can email me at spicardi at topstep.com. Um, you can also go to our website and, and request more information and look through our resources.